is one which uh, our members are very keen on continuing to engage in and expanding further if possible. Uh, this, this scheme, um, you know, to date 156 cases have been completed and there are now a further 637 being actively worked on. And we've had a, I have to say, very constructive engagement from the state sector and the state agencies, particularly from the Housing Agency, the Department of Environment, Community and Local Government and the Citizens Information Bureau in terms of trying to make sure that we can uh, play a much more, a much more uh, creative and productive role in, in maximising that scheme for families who meet the criteria are in distress. Finally then, just in terms of, we have a mortgage advice protocol signed with a number of government departments. I've included it for you there, and there's a commitment from all of the signatories there to pay uh, €250 for financial advice for an independent accountant to a borrower uh, to offer long-term uh, offer long-term loan forbearance so that they understand exactly what's been offered and they're able to make the best decision uh, for their circumstance and for their family. In terms of general consumer information, we have um, recently, in partnership with the Department of Taoiseach and Department of Finance, uh, we have provided a leaflet uh, to every, everybody who is in mortgage arrears um, and also to citizens' advice bureaus, to libraries, to every single Oireachtas member and so on. Uh, that leaflet is really just trying to provide plain English information and we've got a plain, an ala, plain English mark in terms of the accessibility of that information. And that has been delivered and out to everybody who is in distress and, and really it sets out uh, the options they have, explains it in very, very clear and plain English. English and again urges them to engage, get advice and to engage. And, and we also have a residential tenants guide to receivership uh, again which, which is, is very actively uh, pushed out there to, uh, by the lenders and, and other sources to people who find themselves in that, in that, in that situation. So finally there Chairperson and Chairman, in conclusion you know, I and my sector recognise that we, we could have and we do have a very important role to play in supporting housing supply and in addressing the issue of homelessness. We also recognise that banks, or lenders in general, are but one part of a much bigger solution to the public policy challenge that I referred to at the outside. My members in our industry is very willing and, and keen to play our part in the development of a coordinated strategic response which delivers sustainable housing capacity across all of the housing sectors, all of the subsectors, not just one subsector, and that obviously does, does address uh, the issue of homelessness. Our fundamental view is that what we are now facing in the country is, is predominantly a supply problem in each of the four subsectors I've mentioned. And I suppose we look forward, uh, obviously, to taking questions from deputies. If there's information I don't have to hand, I clearly will provide that immediately back to you. And we look forward to engaging on receipt of your report uh, on any individual pieces that you think our sector can play a part in. So thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brett, for your opening statement and the supporting documentation. A number of uh, members will uh, ask a number of questions and you might deal with them collectively rather than individually. And when you're doing so, just one item that came up there, you, and you might elaborate, you talked about the mortgage to rent scheme, that 156 cases uh, have been uh, through that. It seems like a very small number for the scale. So what are the real challenges? It's, everybody agrees it's an effective, or it, it has the potential to be an effective scheme, but 156 cases seems like a drop in the ocean, and you might elaborate on how that could be, um, I suppose, developed to be more effective and more meaningful. Um, my first speaker is Deputy Durkin. Thank you, Chairman, and um, I want to thank Mr. Breton and his colleagues for, for coming before the committee. The useful information to give them, I'm sure, they will be even more useful in the replies to the questions. I, I should mention, uh, Mr. Chairman, that I have had occasion and the pleasure of meeting with their predecessors and their predecessors' predecessors in relation to the same issues and their predecessors. So the first question that comes to my mind, Mr. Chairman, is. is uh, the need to accommodate those in arrears and who are making a, 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 a valid and valiant attempt to meet their mortgage repayments. The, the, the extent to which the banks are willing to accommodate them uh, in a particularly special way, given that the banks themselves were accommodated by the taxpayers of this country and were shown great compassion in the bailout, would it not be a, 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 a natural a, a, a expectation that uh, the, the public who participated and continue to participate in, in, in the rescue of the banking system, that they would be treated with some degree of compassion. And recognising uh, as well that we all deal with, with individual cases, I've dealt with literally scores of these cases, <coughs> as, as, as our, our visitors will know. Um, and you know, it is not always the fault of the borrower uh, that who, who allegedly didn't get in touch. There's a, min a minority of those people. And there are a minority of people as well who do not wish to pay and want to get a better deal and eventually it will come to them. There are also a great majority of people 
who have made huge efforts and made huge sacrifices to meet their monthly payments or a portion thereof within their capacity to pay over the past number of years. And I believe that they deserve to be treated fairly and honestly and to be accommodated. And my question is simply this, to what extent can the banks do that? So two or three more other questions, Mr Chairman. Mortgage availability. I, I've, I, I know you've dealt with scores of people, Chairman. I've, I've certainly done so. And the availability of mortgages at the present time is extraordinarily difficult. And I can understand that coming in at the time we do, after a bubble uh, uh, and, and a, a crash and all that goes with it. But I would have thought that a person who's renting a house and has shown that they've been paying their rent for the last five or six years should, if, if in effect, be the equivalent of the equivalent of, and I know this relates to the central bank as well, the equivalent of their ability, an indication of their ability to pay. I don't see how they're going to, in any event, be able to raise 35 or 40,000 by way of savings if they're paying a mortgage already to a landlord or to a financial institution or whatever the case may be. To what extent, in the event of the central bank being amenable to this, are the banking, is the banking system going to be able to respond? Uh, the, other one is it's a general one in relation to distressed mortgages. The sale of distressed mortgages at the present time to venture capitalists or vulture capitalists, whatever way you want to, you want to see it. And I know that there's a, a, a job for government here in, in, in ensuring that those who acquire uh, such loans uh, treat the people in the same way as those who are, who are regulated. In other words, the unregulated third parties. Uh, how would you view the introduction of legislation to ensure that uh, those people who are purchasing distressed mortgages. Uh, and by distressed mortgages, I, I mean ones that are, that are unsustainable, not by the bank's definition, not by the bank's definition, unsustainable by an independent arbitrary body. And that means that there's no chance, whatever, of the, the borrower ever being, being able to make their payments. And given that, given that, only five or six years ago, the same lending institutions awarded the loans in question. I thought they were quite all right. So the question is, how do we bridge that gap now and how do we treat those people who find themselves in a difficult position? The credit bubble and, and the central bank thing, I will ref wait for the central bank, but I would point out that if the central bank decides to open the, gate, the floodgates and we have the same, re we repeated the same situation that we had at the time that benchmarking was introduced. The reason benchmarking had to be introduced in this country was simply because people could no longer afford to pay their mortgage and live. That was the, the short and simple answer to it. So the, 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 credit, the credit ratings, the cre when I was a member of this house for about 10 years and I could still qualify for a local authority loan. Uh, I remember this house for many years and I couldn't afford the mortgages, that the levels of repayments. Now, as a result of uh, the level of, the, 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 with interest rate much, much lower, of course, but the amount of the repayments expected, 15, 16, 17, two and a half thousand, are, and those are the danger areas. Those ones beyond 14, 1500 a month are the real danger areas from my experience. Can I ask? Yes, sir. What? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I know they are. Yeah. And, 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 you know, I, I've been at the other side of the counter dealing with all these cases for many years now, including the, the time since this government was formed and for many years before. So the point I want to, the, 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 the last point I wanted to make there before I was interrupted was, uh, to what extent can people be given some kind of a credit rating? on the basis of their renting rent uh, uh, record. And the last point is in relation to mortgage to rent, which has already been referred to. Unfortunately, the mortgage to rent is all uh, uh, directed towards the, the housing, voluntary housing agencies, with wh whose activities I have re already referred to on many, many occasions. Uh, to what extent are you prepared to uh, refer, the, the, in such cases, to the local authorities? who in turn uh, will, will, will be able to enhance their, their, their housing uh, stock as a result if they're in a position to purchase. Deputy O'Brien, I just remind colleagues that there's a significant number. Sorry, so sorry, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm just a long time waiting for that, Chairman. And you've had, your, you, you've had your opportunity. But to, to be fair to colleagues, uh, you know, the, the question's directed because we do have the credit union, the League of Credit Unions, later in the afternoon. Deputy O'Brien. Thanks, Chair. Um, first of all, no thanks for the presentation and the supporting documentation. Um, if this committee, I suppose, is to have any value, what we're trying to do and what we're hoping 
the, the pres presenters can help us do is identify things that can be done that aren't currently being done to improve the situation, particularly for those people who are experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. So I suppose we're less interested in, in people uh, uh, justifying, and I don't mean that in a negative way, what they've done to date. We're trying to fix problems that are very clearly there. Um, so I suppose the, the couple of issues I want to run through quickly, it's not to, to get you to repeat what has happened up to now, but to try and identify, uh, are, are there additional things that can be done, changes in policy or legislation or practice that can assist uh, the recommendations we're going to make to central government? So the key issues are this. Uh, First of all, um, while it is true that the overall levels of mortgage distress are reducing, there is still that very, very large cohort, 40,000 excess uh, households in long-term mortgage arrears, and they're the group we're really concerned about because it's many of those people who are either uh, losing their family homes or becoming homeless or who are buy-to-let landlords uh, and uh, their tenants are becoming homeless. Uh, and I suppose many of us have a concern that for that cohort, too few of them have been offered mortgage to rent or split mortgages. Uh, and in fact, a lot of those distressed mortgages are now being sold on by your members to unregulated funds at significant discounts. And if those significant discounts were actually offered uh, in the first instance to the homeowners, that might make that mortgage sustainable. So I I'm keen to know what can we do to try and increase the, the availability of split mortgages or mortgage to rent, uh, particularly to that most distressed cohort. And how can we reduce the level of mortgages being sold on to unregulated vulture funds, uh, which is contributing to the homeless crisis? There's another issue, which is relationship breakdown. Uh, the most recent report from the Homeless Agency showed that the largest contributor to homelessness at the minute is relationship breakdown, about 25 per cent. And many of those people are not able to access social housing support because they are tied into a mortgage. And many of your members are refusing, in the cases I'm dealing with, to remove the party who's leaving the family home as part of the relationship breakdown to come off the mortgage. So how do we deal with that to try and ensure that those people who come off the come out of the family home because of relationship breakdown are not denied access to social housing support and end up in, in homelessness? The other issue is vacant possessions. Too many of your members are now seeking vacant possessions on repossession, and that is forced an increasing number of uh, uh, rental tenants uh, into homelessness. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, your members are sitting on vacant properties that they've repossessed in areas of high social housing demand and won't put those properties on the market because they're waiting for their values to appreciate. It might not be statistically a large number statewide, but in certain areas of the city it is a big number of houses, and I think that's something we need to look at, so I'm interested in your view on that. On the supply end, um, the Institute of Charter Surveyors were in, and they were saying to the committee uh, that for them one of the biggest problems is the high cost and difficulty of private developers getting credit, uh, and particularly credit from banks. Uh, and again, I'm not interested in whether you think that's true or not, but how do we bring down the cost of the credit uh, to good developers who are looking to build homes uh, and homes that are more affordable? Uh, and the last question, Chair. <coughs> um, my understanding of the central bank's mortgage lending rules is that part of the purpose of them is to break the link between house price inflation and the availability of credit. And therefore, if you try and find a way of restricting an aspect of that credit for higher cost homes, it will eventually bring down the cost of homes, particularly first time buyer homes. I keep hearing figures of 280,000, which is in your figures, or 300,000. But in fact, the vast majority of first time buyers aren't buying houses anywhere close to those prices and are buying homes or seeking to buy homes below the 220,000 euros. So I'm interested to know how many mortgage refusals or how many mortgages uh, above the 220 are being refused since the introduction of the new rules uh, on the grounds that people not having the sufficient uh, uh, deposit, because I'm not convinced that that's actually causing the kinds of problems in terms of restricting access to purchasers, and I've yet to see any data. If it's there, uh, I'd be interested to know. But my question, I suppose, on that one is, while clearly the central bank's rules create difficulties for those first-time buyers who are purchasing homes over the 220,000 now, there's a certain degree of prudence in what they're trying to do, which is to reduce the overall amount of borrowing that people required. Surely, from a banking point of view, given where we've all come from in the last 15 years, that's a prudent course of action, and I'm interested to know if you agree with that. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, Deputy Rabbit. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much there on your presentations, and I don't want to repeat any of the questions that was asked before. However, there's one or two things I'd like to ask. Do you ever do mystery shops, or do you ever encourage your banking to do mystery shops to pretend that they're in the role of the, the person in debt to conduct 
questions in relation to try and contact their lender. Because I tried it last week, not in a personal capacity, but for one of my constituents, and I rang up to be told that there is no way that you can actually get through to the mortgage arrears department. In actual fact, you can only ring in, but they can't return a call. You can't be put directly through. You can only go through the, the main switch. And it is one of your main banks that you have mentioned there. And I can talk to you later on again about it. But I found it amazing that in actual fact, six times the call was tried to be get through and I came at different angles at it. And in actual fact, I could at no stage make contact. The SFSs. Um, those SFSs, in actual fact, people have to do not just one run of them, but numerous trial runs of them to actually make themselves inside the market of it. Communications, I feel, is quite poor in relation to the lenders going back to the people, persons in question. And the voluntary sector. I thought it was amazing there that you, if people are in dire distress, go to some of the voluntary sectors to get you through for advice. Now, uh, what I would really like to know is, that's only what I picked up on there, is how you're going to accommodate those in arrears. Where is the Banking Federation going to come from to uh, support the people in arrears? You're dead right. We all have a role to play, be it from our office members to the county councils to the planning, but the banking. I'm wondering, are you going to go back to your members and actually turn and say to them, lads, we're going to put a halt on it all for the next six months. We'll deal with the housing crisis. And this is the role we're going to say, please stop issuing letters to persons. We'll deal with what is there at the moment. Next thing I'd like to know, how many are in three months, six months and nine months in arrears and over 12 months? And the figures then relating to that, how many are 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 and 30,000 in arrears? Because really, they're the people who are at the pen of their collar. They're the persons that are going out, working day and night to try and make it. And like 5,000, 10,000 and still at the same time, the person I was dealing with last week was 30,000 in arrears and was hit with a high court summons in actual fact for her property to be taken off her. I found it excellent amazing that she was 30,000 in arrears. She admitted, and I was helping her there, make numerous phone calls, but to no avail. And um, finally, yeah, that's my story on it. So I think there's a lot there to be digested on it. The Banking Federation, who represents numerous banks in it, have a no, should have a, a role of empathy. And no different to what Deputy Durkin said earlier on, when you were supported in the past, I think it's time for the Banking Federation to show empathy at this stage to the householder in distress without fueling a crisis that's already in disarray. Thank you, Deputy. I'll take one more at this stage. Deputy uh, Function, please. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, a lot of the points have been made already, but the two things that I wanted to mention the mortgage to rent, that's, uh, I, I have a huge issue with mortgage to rent because I think it could be a very good scheme, but I just come across countless cases of where it's not working, there's, there's too difficult, people are being rejected, they're not being given enough information, and a lot of times people are already have been in court, their case may be adjourned, and it's only then maybe when they contact any public rep or someone that they even hear of mortgage to rent, so it doesn't seem to be actively being told to people. Of the 637 that are being actively worked on, and I don't expect you to have the figures here, but if we could get a breakdown of how long they are being worked on, or what stage they're at, and of the 156, how long did it actually take from start to finish for that process to happen? Because I kind of feel sometimes that mortgage to rent, while it looks good on paper, that's, that's all it actually is, and it's maybe designed to sort of deflect from the problem. It looks good that you have a scheme there, but it actually isn't working in reality. The other thing is, um, too much as well I come across where, where the banks just will not negotiate with people. They won't meet them, they won't speak to them. Um, they're kind of pushing for voluntary surrender in cases where, you know, I mean, a lot of the mortgage prices in, in my, my constituency would be in around the 1,200 a euro a month. And you have people saying we can make 700, 750 euro of that, and they're still being told, no, sorry, that's not sustainable. Surely they should be given an opportunity to see if, if it is sustainable. Um, and it's just that there is, there is a, a, a blank wall there for a lot of people when they do, they do uh, actually try and look into it. And it, it takes an awful lot for somebody because when everyone says contact your lender, that's the thing to do. That's the very thing you're afraid of because then you you're feel like you're putting a red circle around yourself and they know about you now and, and it, it's going to get worse. So when people do actually make that step, too often they're, they're met with a wall of silence or, or whatever the, uh, the bank wants to do is just being pushed on them like voluntary surrender. I don't see how that could be a good scheme for anyone. Realistically, if someone is struggling with their mortgage 
and their house, you sell it and they still have a, a mortgage of 100,000, you're never really going to get that money back. And you have a house sitting there idle. It, there's no sense in that. So I just, I would question, you know, some of the, you know, it's, it's easy to say contact your lender, but when people do actually do that, what, you know, attitude are they being given by the banks? Because unfortunately, my experience is it's been extremely negative. Thank you, Deputy. Mr. Brett, uh, just there were a number of specific uh, questions asked in terms of numbers and whatever. If you don't have those available with you today, you might subsequently make them available to the committee. If you have them, well and good. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Deputies. Um, I suppose maybe just try and work through those, those first set of questions. In terms of uh, your, your opening comments, Deputy, in terms of um, needing to accommodate and wanting the figures for those in arrears, um, there, there are 120,739 uh, private dwelling houses uh, uh, which have had restructured uh, arrangements put in place now and uh, as of the most recent figures we get from the central bank 86.86.5 percent of those are meeting in the terms of the arrangement in full uh, so there is there is uh, there are a significant number of cases who have got a restructured arrangement in place and thankfully uh, 86 so 86 and a half percent of them are able to meet uh, the terms of their restructure you asked me specifically about the the mortgage to rent scheme and a number of deputies have have highlighted that the deputy function uh, and, and yourself I suppose in terms of the mortgage to rent scheme and it might be interesting to have the Department of Environment and the housing agency also brief you uh, in terms of their perspective on, on the scheme our lenders are extremely keen on the mortgage to rent scheme it's a good solution uh, for eligible uh, families and mortgage holders. Uh, it's also a good solution for lenders, and I believe it's a good solution for the state in that it does keep families in their, in their houses. It keeps children close to their local school. It stops people having to move. It, it's all of that thing around social inclusion, but it also makes financial sense for the lender, and it makes good sense for the, for the, for the, for the, uh, the, the, the individual and their family. We've had a lot of engagement with um, Citizens Information Bureau, the Department of Environment, and the, uh, the housing agency in particular with people like uh, Claire Feeney and Nina Murray um, and Angela Black. Um, we have, I think we have ironed out a lot of the early problems. And for example, there are some difficulties uh, in this case uh, with um, people who don't want to be in the scheme. Uh, there are others where um, banks are referring cases and in the early stage, several of those turned out to be ineligible. And um, so they're, they're, you know, we got off to a good start with lots of referrals, but as we worked through them, as the, as the system worked through, and I should say the mortgage to rent scheme is obviously run by the state, um, the kind of reasons for cases being terminated were in, 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 in eligibility, uh, a borrower who wouldn't agree or who changes their mind in terms of the process, um, borrower circumstances changing, um, the the, the uh, approved housing body and the lender not being able to agree, uh, agree on price. So for example, there, you know, the, the lender would do a valuation on the property, the housing body would do, an, an, a, and the two might be quite a long way apart. The lender is in, in a legal bind in that it's obliged to get the highest possible value it can for the mortgage holder because they're going to hold the residual debt. Um, so, so clearly there has been a lot of progress and now there's one agreed valuation and I believe that's going to speed, ma speed matters up particularly. But as, 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 as lenders, uh, the lenders are very, very keen on this scheme. This, this is a much more efficient scheme. Um, you know, the, the, taking possession, going through the legal process and taking possession of somebody's house has to be a last resort. And clearly, it's an extremely costly and protracted process. And it's not the best outcome. Obviously, it's not the best outcome for the lender and their family. It's also not the best outcome for, uh, for, for the lender. So clearly, we would like to see even more uh, push through into, into the mortgage to rent scheme. There may be a challenge uh, to the, uh, for the state in providing funding for that because clearly the state is buying, buying those properties uh, at a reduced price and keeping that family in them and renting, the, renting, renting you know, mortgage to rent in that scheme. So clearly there may be issues for the state in terms of how much funding it's prepared to put into the scheme. Um, certainly the lenders have moved a long way in terms of the valuation and the kind of price that, 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 that houses are going at. There are some, not issues particularly for the lender, but there are some issues and some concerns some people raise in terms of mortgage to rent because there, there, are, there is a view that for some people they can jump a housing list by virtue of being in this scheme. Now, that's a social policy issue, that's not a banking issue, um, but it, it is an issue that, that many, people, many people raise. Um, I think we have much better processes in place uh, in each of the individual lenders now. 
and the lenders are making referrals. Um, and I mean, it would be interesting for you to hear the other side of that equation, what the Department of Environment and the Housing Agency think. Um, but I do believe that it is a scheme that we should be maximising and using an awful lot more. It, it, is, it is a good scheme. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of teething problems around valuation, around that whole process. Um, and uh, uh, I, think, I think we're closing cases, that the scheme is closing its cases at a much quicker pace, um, mainly due to better conveyancing processes at, uh, at, some, at some of the banks, um, but in terms of getting the cases through much faster. Um, in the early days, there was a lot of disagreement about the actual value of a house. The lender would have a value here. The, the person who owned the house or who had the mortgage would have another val value in their mind, and then the approved housing body would be here, and never the twain would meet. The move now to having one agreed valuation uh, clearly removes that block, and I believe that's, that's very significant. And we're very grateful to the engagement we get from the state agencies in terms of, in terms of moving that through. In terms of mortgage availability, um, the key issue here has got to be the ability to repay, um, and there is no point in just in de indebting people and adding, adding, adding debt on people who don't have the ability to repay. And I, I agree, in terms of a track record of paying rent, um, clearly that's showing that a person is able to pay over a sustained period of time, often, over, often higher than what the mortgage repayment would be on a similar property, and often higher than what you know, that mortgage, with, with some level of stress on it, I mean, in terms of future interest rate rises. So the key issue here it, it has got to be the ability to repay under stress. Um, and, and I mean, I, I know in terms of bank lending rules, they do uh, as much as they can take into account uh, that proven ability to repay. Um, it may be, and I'm conscious Deputy Director said you will have some engagement with the central bank, it may be an issue you want to talk to them in terms of, in terms of the, the, the macro potential rules. In terms of the sale of distressed mortgages to, to, uh, in, to investors or, or other forms of, um, you know, yeah, absolutely. What I, what I would say to you is that we welcomed as an industry the regulation of the, the loan servicers. Um, that was a big step because up until very recently, the lender was regulated, the loan servicer was not regulated. Thankfully, they are now regulated and we've taken some of those into membership on the, on the basis that they now are regulated entities. Um, you know, clearly, I think it, it very much is within the gift of the central bank as, as the regulator to determine how, how best it wants to, to deal with the next step in, ter in terms of investors. I mean, from, you know, from, from our perspective, we don't, have, we don't represent uh, investors or speculators or people who are buying in that context. So I don't really have, I don't have a, a view in terms of you know, what, what their view might be. Um, so, so really, that is very much within the gift of the regulator to determine the most appropriate policy intervention. But we certainly did welcome in, in this house, in the committee, and we did in our submission, we very much did push for and support the regulation of loan servicers. I mean, clearly, that's an important part of the equation. And I agree with you, Deputy Durkin, that there is now an unregulated uh, third, third element. And that, that's perhaps something uh, for further discussion with the central bank. In terms of the credit bubble, um, you know, I absolutely agree. There is no point in, in driving up house prices, in further indebting, the, in debt, in Ca causing further indebtedness for individuals and families in this country. That's not going to address the core issue we're talking about today, which is housing, housing and homelessness. Uh, what's needed, in my opinion, is an increase in supply, rather than pushing up prices and pushing up indebtedness uh, and not solving the problem. So I believe what we need is a coordinated intervention on four levels. We need a proper approach to social housing. We need a proper approach, an integrated approach to, um, to affordable housing. We need some interventions in terms of the private rented sector and clearly the part that my members are predominantly involved in is in terms of the owner occupied, the mortgage sector. I've set out for you uh, the levels, of, the levels of, of mortgage and the rules really are, you know, and we would be supportive of the central bank's uh, intention in terms of trying to stop a credit driven, a credit -driven bubble. Um, and, and, you know, we think it's very important that the Governor is, as I say, looking for uh, written submissions uh, from all stakeholders, and we certainly will submit uh, on that basis, but we are supportive of the principle of, of trying to avoid, uh, you know, a, another credit-driven bubble. And I think we have to learn, not just my sector, I think right across we have to understand what happened last time out, and we just cannot repeat that exercise. Uh, so, so, so certainly, um, you know, I would be very much in the same mind as the Deputy in terms of not driving up house prices. Um, by interventions and making sure that we don't um, force further families into indebtedness. Supply, however, is the key issue in each of the four sectors, and it will be different in different locations around the country. In terms of uh, relationship breakdowns, 
I think, uh, sorry, Deputy O'Brien, your, your question in terms of relationship breakdowns, um, it's not an issue I've, I've personally encountered. I mean, obviously, as a federation, we're not involved between the customers and the individual customers and their bank. It certainly is an issue I'll go back and talk to, to the lenders on. And I might talk to you separately in terms of just trying to understand uh, what the issues are. I can imagine from a lender's point of view, they've got two parties to a mortgage. The mortgage is granted on the ability to repay. And if you then exit one of those people, um, you know, that, that, that potentially is an issue. But I certainly might talk to you separately, and I'm very willing and very, very keen to go back and talk to lenders on that. In terms of vacant possession and being sought on, on, on ownership, um, I'm surprised to hear that, that any lender would be sitting on, on vacant, uh, vacant properties. Banks and lenders are not good uh, operators of property. They're not good at, at managing property. It's not their core, their core uh, business whatsoever. And all they're doing is, is depreciating their asset and adding costs for themselves. So certainly, if that's a problem, if it's just localised, uh, again, it would be useful for me to get, to get it, and, if you, you know, and I'll take that up with individual banks. Uh, it's not an issue that I'm, I'm aware of across the industry, and it would seem to me to be an unusual practice. But it, I'm not saying to you that I, I agree with you, you know, if it's there, I accept it's there, but I'd like to take it back and talk to the, the, lend, the lenders concerned. I think, Deputy O'Brien, I've touched on the mortgage to rent scheme, and, and hopefully I've, I've answered it that. Um, and in, term, in terms of supply, uh, the big issue for me here is equity, is that people can actually access the appropriate housing for themselves, and, and, and clearly that we're not uh, just having a one, one trick solution to this. I mean, the, tricks, the, the solution here is not just providing loads and loads of credit and loads and loads of mortgages. Credit and mortgages are important for people who are in that sector and have the ability to repay. But that's not going to address the homelessness, the homelessness issue. There's a supply issue here, and I think it's very important, and I note with interest other parties coming in to give evidence to you, I think it's very important that whatever recommendations are put forward by any of us coming to this table, um, that we realise there's no one solution, and every single solution needs to be stress-tested for unintended consequences, and we really must, must not go down the route of just having one solution. Uh, in terms, then, um, of private developers uh, getting credit uh, from, 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 from my members, I mean, the message I would have for you is my lenders are, I mean, they clearly, they, if they don't lend prudently and properly, they don't make a profit. They need to lend. One of the key challenges is people having enough equity coming to the, coming to the table to do, to do those deals. It is interesting to talk to the Credit Review Office in terms of people who have been declined, uh, declined. and they, the Credit Review Office do have powers to go back and uh, force banks to look again at their decisions. Equity, however, is, is, the key, is the key issue here. I believe there's a lot of credit available in, this, available in the system. In the past, it's my understanding that in many instances, people would be using the equity in the previous development to leverage the next one. And, you know, we understand now as a country and as a sector, we understand where that leads us. So clearly, if people are going to look to fund a development or a, you know, a business or a development, they need to have equity. And that's the challenge. You know, the banks cannot provide 100% finance with no equity. We have to find a way as a country to plug the equity gap. Uh, there are a number of sources of, of capital out there, of, of, of funding out there. I mean, you know, there's, there's straightforward bank funding, there are other, there's state funding, there's all kinds of other funding out there, the, the strategic investment, all of that funding is there, European, European Investment Bank funding. But the problem is equity, in my opinion, and how we bridge that equity gap. Uh, and certainly, just continuing to leverage on past, past is not the way to go. Um, so I think that, that's important. Uh, and again, I, I, would, I would say to deputies, you know, the, the role of the Credit Review Office and, and their findings and their powers are significant here. And, and I mean, it might be interesting for you even to have a written submission in terms of what they're finding in relation to the housing sector and what, what their findings, excuse me, are and what their views are. In terms, uh, Deputy of the, uh, Deputy O'Brien, in terms of the, the, the central bank rules, um, and uh, your, your point in relation to the 220 euro, uh, the ones above and below that, the refusals, sorry, uh, I don't have that data. Um, that would be data I suspect that the central bank would, would have. I mean, I don't get uh, individual data. I'm looking to colleagues if... Well, I'm not even sure they'd get the refusal level data. Um, that would be more bank by bank. I'm not even sure they publish it. I mean, we, we took the 280s kind of typical price in Dublin and looked at the sort of level of deposit you'd have to put in place. Um, but a lot of that would come back. It's not, A, clearly there is a challenge getting a deposit of that amount um, for a 280,000 euro house. Uh, other than that, for the bank, it comes back to the affordability discussion we've had and the ability to pay. Um, that's kind of where the bank starts. I mean, if you look at the two types of caps, the loan to value and the loan to income, it's the loan to income that the banks would focus on the most.
happens. But just because this is an important point, yeah. so the 280,000 isn't actually an average first-time buyer price in Dublin based on any research or figures, it's just a guess. Well, I, I don't think we're guessing, but I mean, I'd have to check. I, I can certainly go back and confirm where we got the figure from, but it's, it's certain, I don't believe it's a guess. Chairman, thank you. Um, Conscious Deputy Rabbit asked me, uh, you know, a, a very straight question in relation to difficulty getting through to an individual lender. Before I leave, if time, I might get the details and I will speak to that bank CEO this evening. Um, you know, clearly that's not a, a good situation. What I'm saying to people is engage with your lender, engage with whatever independent advice best suits your situation. But if you have a difficulty talking, getting through to the lender, well then clearly we've got something wrong and I will take that up with that individual bank CEO this evening. Um, you, you talked about, you know, that, you know, the lenders were just kind of saying, well, go and contact the voluntary sector. Um, we work with all of the sectors, though MAB's been in the state sector, ISI. Uh, several of my member lenders funded in full uh, the Step Change, which is an independent debt advice charity, telephone based, and have funded in the millions to set them up and pay in, in full for their operation. So, you know, it, it isn't the case that we're saying to people, just go and talk to a charity. Go and talk to whichever is the advice that best, best fits your situation and which you personally as an individual and family are most comfortable doing. In many instances, I suspect constituents will be coming in to yourselves and your colleagues in the first instance, and you may be the gatekeeper recommending them, uh, you know, to go, to go a particular route in, term, in terms of what's there. The important thing is that there's a menu for somebody and that people can pick the, the solution that best suits them. What we're finding, for example, is that there's a certain cohort of people prefer to do this, do this business over the telephone with, with Step Change or MAB's National Helpline. There are other, uh, other borrowers who much prefer to go and have a face-to-face -face sit down with somebody and have a proper discussion. In addition to the things that we've funded and done at an industry level, I'm very conscious that several of the lenders have funded and do continue to fund individual arrangements themselves. So if you look on a bank by bank basis, they're all signatories to the things we've done at an industry level. In addition to that, several of them, many of them, all of them virtually have other arrangements in place. So I certainly wouldn't want the perception to be we're saying to people who are in, in terrible distress as families and individuals that we'd be saying to them, we'll just phone up a charity. What I was trying to make clear, and that's why I added them in the submission, was to say there is, there is a menu of options there, up to and including, you know, independent private financial adv or private advice, professional advice, and I would really urge people to determine, uh, you know, to, to first of all, to, to, you know, to recognise that they are in distress and, and to find the most appropriate uh, uh, level of support uh, to follow what we say in the leaflet and really choose the one you're most comfortable with and the one that best meets your circumstance. In terms of the, the SFS, um, yes, I mean, it is, it is I mean, I've I looked in detail, it is a very, very daunting document and it is, I mean, I suspect if any one of us around this table had to fill it in for our own personal circumstance, it's not an easy process. And that's why, again, I would urge people to sit down with somebody like MABS or somebody like Step Change and who have the expertise in filling these in and walk through them. I included it in my pack because I wanted to show the deputies just how complicated it actually is. Um, but that's, that's the process that it's not set by the lenders. That's the process you have to go through. And it, it can be done. And there are people in the country who have a lot of expertise in assisting people. And we have to understand that there can, be, there can be language issues, there can be literacy issues, there can be numeracy issues, all the more reason to engage with um, one, of the, one of the supports that, that, are, that are there and choosing the one that you're most comfortable with as an individual. In terms of, uh, in terms of the numbers in arrears, um, clearly the central bank publish uh, the, the arrears data. Um, I, I have some very high level data that I'm very happy to, um, you know, maybe just, just to go through in terms of, in terms of uh, where, where things are at. In terms of, and, and again, I'm relying here on figures from central bank. I mean, I don't, I, I, I'm precluded from reaching obviously into, indivi into individual lenders. As a federation, comp we're precluded on competition kind of grounds from getting into some of these issues. So we would be relying on central bank publish published figures. So according to their most recent figures, uh, as, as, as of the end of 2015, and I anticipate these figures will have improved uh, even more, but at the end of 2015, there are um, the, the, the number of mortgages in arrears does continue to fall. It's currently standing at um, 88,292, which is 11.8% of all accounts in arrears. In terms of two categories, uh, pri private dwelling houses and buy to lets. In terms of private dwelling houses, there are, um, th there are um, in terms of categories, there are uh, 61,931 accounts, uh, which are 90 days plus in arrears. 
And the category we should all be most concerned at are those who are 720 days plus. There are 36,351 in that. Now, that's been falling, thankfully, um, since 2015. And overall, as I said to the chairperson at, at, at earlier on in reply, of the private dwelling houses, uh, there, there have been to date um, 120,739 accounts restructured. And it, as I say, 86.5% of those are meeting the arrangements in full. In terms of the buy-to-let market, there are 23,000 accounts uh, greater than 90 days in arrears. And again, uh, in the most concerning uh, are those 720 days in arrears, uh, fifth, just over 15,064 accounts in that category. Again, I cannot restate enough the importance between the enga of engagement between the borrower and the lender. It's, the, it's, it's in everybody's interest, including the lenders, to, to address the issue uh, and to try, to try and resolve it. Um, I should also point out that rent receivers have now been appointed to 5,967 accounts. If there are more specific granularity that the committee wants, because I'm conscious you'll have private session, if the clerk just rings me, if I don't have it myself, I'll certainly try and source it from the central bank, or you may choose to source it directly there from them. It's on their website, it's published. Um, you know, so that, I suppose I, I wasn't expecting to get into this level of detail on, I thought I might be talking more you know, at the broader macro social policy, but I'll certainly, um, you know, if, if you clarify what you need, I'll, I'll certainly do my best to get it to you. Um, uh, deputy, deputy Function, sorry, I just, I'm not sure if I've covered your issue adequately for you on, on the, the people who are ejected in the, in the mortgage to rent. I mean, I've kind of highlighted for you the kind of reasons, and I will admit, um, from our perspective, in the early days of the scheme, we were probably, the lenders were probably so keen to do this. They were referring cases that, with the benefit of hindsight, didn't strictly meet the criteria. It may, however, be interesting for the committee to get the perspective, as I say, from Environment and the, house, the, housing, the housing agency. Um, and, and in terms, you know, I, I suppose that, that's the key piece in terms of mortgage to rent. If I haven't covered any deputy, please well, flag it. I think I probably it, have. Um, you probably have at the moment, but there are a number of other deputies who were not finished with you who have uh, indicated they have questions. Uh, deputy Coppinger. Thanks, uh, Chair. Yeah, the, you said in your introduction, Mr. Brett, that homelessness was largely a supply issue, but homelessness is being caused by repossessions being done by your members right now. It's not just a supply issue. People are actually in houses and they're being put out of houses. So otherwise homelessness wouldn't be increasing. It's not just supply. So you need to correct that. So the biggest reason that I'm seeing people being made homeless right now is because they're living in a rented property which has been repossessed by a bank. That's bar no other reason. Um, so you, you haven't actually mentioned it in your introduction. Um, so either the banks, you know, put pressure on the owner of the property to sell it, or they pass it over to a receiver, usually, to do the evicting. Um, and I don't think that they ask too many questions about who's living in the house. Um, so there is a code of conduct for people in mortgage arrears. I'm not saying it's sufficient, it isn't. But there's no code to protect people who are really vulnerable right now, living in private rented accommodation, which has been an ever-growing sector of this society. And they're the biggest group in poverty due to you know, rent increases and also due to maybe cuts if some of them are on rent supplement. Um, I know a lot of families right now in emergency accommodation for up to a year because they've been evicted by receivers working for the banks, um, and there's been an increase in that. So I, I think the government should outlaw this while there's a housing emergency, but failing them doing that, would you not take it upon yourselves voluntarily to insist that no family is put out into emergency com accommodation, as a, which is a cost on the state, obviously, um, if they don't have anywhere else to go? And they don't have anywhere else to go. That's the reality of it. But I haven't heard you saying anything about this, you know. Um, just the other thing is your role in the overall housing crisis. Um, that's one immediate role. But also the, there's been a huge cut in the capital budget on social housing. In, from 2008 to 2014, uh, 11.4 billion was taken out of the capital budget for social housing. That coincided with the bailout of your members by the taxpayer. That's why it was cut. You know, so given that the bailout of the banks uh, and speculators, etc., 
played such a role in cutting social housing spending. Like, for example, in 2008, there was 1.4 billion being spent on social housing. Last year, there was 500 million. So it's about a third of what it used to be. Um, so it does relate to the recession that was brought about by the financial sector. Um, so given that, I suppose the last question I'd have is, is about people who are in mortgage arrears, be they buy to lets or be, be they homeowners themselves. So would you not agree that there should be a more generalised write down on mortgage arrears at this stage? Um, the, the figures that were listed on the housing agency that were in the other day gave us a lot of figures on this and we're very concerned about this as well. I won't go through them all again, but restructuring, like it's all very well for people to say do more, split mortgages and stuff like that, but that's just delaying the inevitable for the person unless their financial circumstances improve. Um, and even the housing agency would say that. So you seem to be more willing to write down the debts of developers than you are to write down mortgage debts. AIB wrote off over four billion in commercial property loans between January 2014 and the end of, or sorry, June 2015, compared to 820 million on all mortgages, including buy to lets. But yet, your mor the mortgage books of AIB were bigger than their commercial property sector. So it just seems to be one law for developers who obviously don't have the money, but neither do the people who are pay who bought these inflated houses um, over the years. So. There seems to be a very generous attitude to the developers that isn't replicated with homeowners. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Wallace. Thank you, uh, yeah, I'll be brief. Um, just, I think it would be dishonest not to raise the point that, I mean, you talk about the amount of work that the bank do towards uh, trying to work with people and whatever, but I think uh, it would be wrong of us not to highlight the fact that uh, People from, well, I can tell you from my own experience, and I'm sure it's not much different from the other deputies, that people from all over, from every county in Ireland have contacted me and have found you very, the banks to be very, very difficult to work with, found them inflexible and lacking in understanding and compassion. Uh, the, the, uh, I suppose the fact that uh, uh, the Irish banks would be 10,000 leagues under the sea, but the fact that they were bailed out by the taxpayer isn't lost, isn't lost on them. And, uh, they would probably... Uh, I have expected some sort of a little social dividend in return in some form, and uh, they don't probably see it. Um, the, uh, on the, there's, you, you made the point that uh, eviction is not the best outcome for the lender. And you know what? I'd say you're dead right. <laughs> but I mean, it, um, it certainly isn't the best outcome for the tenant either, uh, or the mortgage holder. And... Uh, I actually, even from an economic point of view, um, I, I'd be very sceptical as to whether um, there is much merit in use of it in anybody. Um, I don't think it's worked. I don't think it's good financially. Uh, it's, it's caused un untold social uh, hardship uh, for people. Um, I mean, it's, you've, it's, dr it's driven people into, uh, into poverty. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't think it was a good business decision uh, by the Irish banks uh, to go down that route, uh, irrespective of uh, the lack of activity from the state sector. And uh, I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Uh, just on the commercial side of things, um, I'd be pretty well aware of the fact that at the moment, um, if, if somebody wanted to build 20 houses on a vacant site in Dublin or any other town in Ireland, uh, they would find it so, so difficult to get money from an Irish bank almost impossible and uh, anyone that was building in the time can remember banks going around and asking us if we wanted money and uh, now it's impossible to get but uh, uh, the banks in Ireland uh, did avail of incredibly cheap money from the ECB uh, and uh, it does look as if uh, you invested it uh, somewhere else, uh, a lot of it wasn't invested in Ireland um, even though uh, the ECB would have ar argued at the time that um, it was that they, they cared and that uh, 
that were helping our, our economy recover, especially given the fact that uh, the people have been asked to bail out these failed financial institutions. But in actual fact, it looks like uh, the banks went off and invested it elsewhere where there was less risk involved. Uh, I suppose the point I'm just trying to make, and just representing the people that have contacted me, uh, is that uh, they, they are very uh, sore about the fact that uh, fairness hasn't been applied. They've obviously watched the the, the uh, incredible write downs of IBRC and NAMA, and uh, and they find it so difficult to get any write down. Thank, thank you, Deputy. Uh, Mr. Brett, just before they're the final questions, just before you conclude uh, to, to reply to those, I want to reiterate the point that Deputy Coppinger made, and this is certainly uh, landlords who the banks are taking action against. Against, and from where I see it, in all cases, the Banks seem to want the houses with no tenants and they're vacant. And I'm wondering, you know, we're looking at a housing crisis and many of us view it as an emergency and we're looking at things that could be done as short-term solutions. We would hold local authorities to account for the voids that they have and how quickly they can turn them around. I'm wondering, has the banking sector any idea how many properties and units of accommodation fall into this category where they have acted against, where they've taken actions against landlords who were in difficulties and the properties are sitting today vacant where they could be tenanted. Uh, is, has that been, have the bank a view on the capacity that exists? Thank you. Thank you, <coughs> Thank you Chairman. Okay. Um, I think that, that the last question, I might just, just deal with that one first, that goes back to uh, Deputy O'Brien's question earlier about uh, people sitting on, on vacant properties. I mean, certainly I will go back and speak with members. I'm not aware of that being an issue out there. It would be in people's interest to, you know, not to have vacant properties depreciating in value, being vandalised and all of those things. So I'll go away and I'll, I'll, I'll respond in, in relation to that one. In terms of, uh, and maybe to clarify uh, Deputy Coppinger, I'm not in, for one minute suggesting that uh, homelessness in its acute form as we're seeing at the moment is purely a, su a supply issue. What I, what I think I was saying earlier was there is a supply issue in my opinion uh, at a, at, in terms of broad macro social policy. There is a supply issue in terms of social housing, affordable housing, uh, rented accommodation and you know, there, ha there is an issue also there, there, in terms of owned accommodation or mortgaged accommodation. I mean, there is, it, it's quite clear, uh, that, you know, there is a good supply now of mortgage credit, but there isn't a good supply of houses to people to buy in that category. I take your point uh, and take your point uh, very clearly, and it's very well made in terms of Ireland's social policy going back, uh, not just to the point of the crash, but going, perhaps going back a little bit further. Uh, there were decisions taken around uh, how social, social and affordable housing was provided in this country. Um, and, you know, clearly we, we haven't provided adequate, as a country now, adequate social or affordable housing for quite a long period of time. And I think that's exacerbated now because we have increased, we have increased rents and we have a, a, a shortage of homes for people to buy. There are, I mean, clearly, um, you know, one would hope that, you know, thankfully, I, you know, increasing employment is, is, is important in terms of people's, people's ability um, you know, to, to meet uh, some of the pressures they fit, fit. However, we just cannot, and I, I keep saying to your committee, we, we, we must avoid another, another credit bubble. We have to find mechanisms to put supply in all of those four subsectors where it's actually needed. Um, and I, I think that's, you know, that, that's the key, in, in my opinion, here. And, and every one of these things have unintended consequences. And we need to be very clear about how money transfers across the economy, because an intervention in one sector costs somebody in another sector. And I mean in that, I mean, you know, what, what a, a subsidy in one sector does to the availability of social housing, because this is a zero-sum game. So I think it's very, very important, uh, and I want to be very clear that I'm not suggesting um, that homelessness can just be sorted by supply. I mean, that, that is a much more complex issue, and it, it cuts across uh, quite a lot of different, different elements of, of, of social policy and public policy in Ireland. In terms of, uh, and again, I probably should have made this clear at the outset, as a federation, uh, you know, we don't, I don't get into the practices of individual banks or the competitive issues between banks. I'm specifically precluded by competition law from doing that. So, you know, I, I can't, uh, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to tell you why a particular bank takes a particular line. I mean, they all must take individual business decisions. What I will say to you is that, you know, for any economy to function, properly and effectively for all of its citizens. You have to have a sustainable functioning bank 
banking banking system. I mean, the banking system is important in, in, in an economy, and uh, you know, individual banks will have to look at you know do have to look at you know the the, the pressures they face, the business model they follow, and, and they have to make their individual decisions. And I don't have a control or oversight or the knowledge even in, into some some of those individual pieces. In terms of um, compassion. Uh, Deputy Wallace, the bank's, bank's com compassion and the eviction rates. Um, you know, I think um, what we've tried to do in terms of the things we've done at a cross-industry level and things individual banks have done is try to equip borrowers in distress with the kind of support they need uh, to maybe level up the power imbalance that can exist when you're, when you're in distress and you're trying to deal with, um, you know, with, 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 with your lender. In terms of repossessions, um, Looking at the, the court's statistics in Ireland, there were, for the entire year 2015, there were 722 repossessions on foot of a court order. Um, there were an additional number that were voluntarily surrendered. In, in the Irish context, the repossession rate represents 0.21% of all mortgages, whereas in the UK, it's three times higher, 0.65%. Uh, percent of all mortgages. Now, I'm not for one minute saying that makes it okay. It doesn't. Um, I have heard the previous governor of the central bank speaking and saying that in a fully functioning mortgage market, you would expect ordinarily to have up to 2% of those mortgages uh, defaulting and, in, and, and going down that route. Um, that doesn't make it any easier, and I agree with you, Deputy, in terms of the compassion. Um, the, the evidence out there in terms of the number of restructured mortgages and the increase in the, in the way that's been worked through, and also the, the fact that 86.5% of them are meeting the terms of their, their arrangement, is good, it's good early evidence to me uh, that banks are, are seeking to be more compassionate and do realise that it's in everybody's interest, including the banks, including the, lend, including the person who's borrowed the money, if they can remain in their property. Um, so clearly there is some good evidence there, and it comes back to our comments for people who, you know, people who can't go down that route, that we would have interventions like the mortgage to rent scheme. And I guess, I guess it is important to repeat again that you know, banks, banks need to be profitable, banks need to survive, and to survive they need to do business. And I'm very keen to engage with your committee in terms of how we can play a viable part in the various subsectors of the housing market uh, that we referred to and we've spoken to a number of times. I think, I think I've covered off. Oh, sorry, Deputy, in terms of, in terms of the de developers, Deputy was, uh, you know, the key issue, as I said, is going to be equity. Uh, I believe there's a lot of credit available in the, in the Irish economy for, uh, for builders and for developers. Uh, however, the problem is uh, developers who are maybe bruised from the previous experience not having the equity. That's the challenge. And there is no bank in Ireland, no lender in Ireland, uh, who would be permitted under the rules now to lend, nor should they, lend 100% uh, uh, you know, on, on any development. And that's, that's a big challenge. And the challenge, and I don't have an answer, is how do we get equity into the system? But what I can say to you from, a lender, from my, my members' point of view, they need to lend in this sector, but only to viable, uh, viable people who have the equity. Yeah. Yes, I think I just, Deputy Wallace, just yeah. to allow you to develop that point. Yeah, yeah just uh, that issue. I mean, ha have you had any discussions with the state in relation to actually some form of, uh, of, of, of working with the state, some form of guarantee towards loaning to uh, builders who are prepared to build houses uh, on sites that they have access to? I mean, has there been any engagement with the state or do you talk to them at all in that area? Okay. Ask Morris just to yeah, I mean, we, I suppose probably the, the main conversations we'd have, and maybe not as many as we'd like, would be the Strategic Bank Corporation Ireland, which seems to us be kind of the appropriate model for, for what you're talking about. Because we've been discussing with them, I suppose, at two levels. One is, and it wasn't necessarily in the housing space, but we started off talking to them on the SME side of things, just general SME lending, because we were facing the same challenge on the SME side. SME balance sheets had been hard hit by the recession. And again, looking for borrowing for working capital and investment, but again, banks not being in a position to lend 100%. So certainly conversation with Strategic Bank Corporation Ireland around that. I, I suppose there haven't been as many conversations on the, on the property side, to, to be honest, at this stage, but we have certainly had a number of conversations with them. Are there avenues, either using pure equity, to your point, or an enhancement of the existing credit guarantee scheme that the, the Department of Enterprise launched uh, was another area that we've had conversations with them? Because 
pure equity doesn't just have to be cash equity, obviously, at the end of the day. Credit guarantee schemes would have a role to play. But I think the one that's there, it's, it is in the process, I think, Felix, are being enhanced right now, the, the credit guarantee scheme, and they all have a role to play. So I suppose in answer, yes, we've had conversations. Have they gone all the way to where we like them to go? Probably not, and they probably need to continue. And, and it's an issue we, will, as a committee, probably need to look further at. Uh, Mr. Sir, Sir, could they answer my question about would they not develop a voluntary code of not evicting okay, people yeah. from houses that they're in right now, which is the biggest uh, cause of homelessness? Mr. At Mr. Moment? Brett, okay. that point. Okay. Two issues, if, if I may, just, just on, on Deputy Wallace. I mean, we, we would welcome uh, recommendations from your committee in terms of the issues Morris said. You know, the. the, the issues of plugging the gap. The gap. Um, there is European Investment Bank funding also available. I think at present, you know, the funding is there, but it's there as, as loan funding. Uh, what we really need is equity funding, um, and I think that's the challenge. And we, we would love to see um, some development of that, uh, and maybe perhaps your committee might think about that. In terms, in terms Deputy, in terms of a voluntary code, it, is, it isn't really within my gift as, as, a, as, a, as a trade body to do that. I mean, certainly I will talk to members, and I will, you know, I will, I will, I will bring back um, several of the issues raised with me here today, but it's, it's not within my gift, um, you know.